Okay, so in the last video I showed a bunch of different aircraft that I use and all of the components that kind of go with them, like the ESC, the motor, the prop, the, tra the, the transmitter, the receiver, everything like that. But what I want to talk about in this video is how do you actually design the aircraft to do what you want it to do. You want it to fly, but perhaps you want it to do barrel rolls or fly inverted or fly straight up. Maybe you want a glider or a racer or something like that. I've taught this course called Radio Controlled Aircraft Design for about four years now, and I've sort of tweaked how I teach my students to design and build their own aircraft. And this is sort of my like nine-step method on what to do to design an aircraft. Um, the first thing that I'll, I tell the students to start off with is to decide what they want their aircraft to do. Do you want a glider? Do you want a trainer? Do you want an aerobatic and a sport flyer? Do you want a scale, a warbird, or a racer? And what to, the parameter that I tell them to choose first is what's called the wing cube loading. And the wing cube loading is the weight of the vehicle divided by the area to the three halves power. And so basically, if you have a very, very heavy aircraft with small wings, you're going to have a really, really big wing loading. And what that means is that you're going to be, you, you, because, so, so lift is equal to one half rho v squared SCL, right? So if the area of the wing is small, and you have a heavy aircraft, in order to get a lot of lift, you need to fly very, very fast. So if you have short, stubby wings, you need to fly very, very fast. If you have a glider, you're going to have very, very big wings and a very, very light aircraft, and therefore your wing loading will be low. And the graphic that I drew here is basically a rectangular wing. I drew a little square here, and basically what it means is it's the amount of lift or weight per square foot on the wing. And so if you want a glider, you want that to be really, really low so that basically every square foot of the wing is barely supporting any weight. And if you want something to go really, really fast, you want that to be high because you don't need that much lift in one, or you don't need that much area when you're flying fast because you just have so much dynamic pressure. For this example, I'm going to pick a wing loading of nine. So that's going to be kind of on the, on the, on the tail end of an aerobatic sport. So it'll still be pretty nimble and maneuverable, but it'll be really fast. And so I, want, I wanted something that was fast. Not necessarily like a racer, but something that was faster than, say, you know, an aircraft like this. So this is a trainer aircraft, so this is going to be in the 5 to 7 range. I wanted something that was a little bit faster than this, but operated pretty much the same. Okay, so I picked a wing loading of 9. This equation has three unknowns. Once you choose your design point, your wing loading, you need to determine one of these two things. I find that the easiest thing to do, and what I learned in, when I took uh, aircraft design in college, my capstone uh, design professor told me to, or, or really this is, you know, he had 40 years of, uh, of expertise in this area, and it was to determine the weight of your aircraft, to estimate the weight. And so I sort of tabulated all of the different components. You've got battery, speed control, motor prop, receiver, and then three servos. So I've got a, a servo to the elevator, a servo to the aileron, and a servo to the rudder, so three servos. And so what I did was I went on Google and I looked up all of the different parameters for all of the different components that I think I'm going to put into this aircraft, and I basically grabbed the weight. I already knew I wanted to put a four cell LiPo in this because I have a bunch of four cell LiPos for my racing drone, and so I grabbed the weight of that. I had to kind of look around for different motors for a variety of reasons. First off, once you have your estimate of your weight, and after I did all this, I got about 43 ounces of weight, you need to determine what's called a thrust to weight ratio. And so after all of this, this whole thing is an iterative process. If you want to optimize your aircraft, you have to sort of iterate through all of this. At the very end of the day, you need to choose the, you need to think, make sure you have enough thrust to overcome drag so that you can fly fast enough to get enough lift to keep you in the air. Remember, thrust has to equal drag, and lift has to equal weight. And so you need to be able to fly fast enough to get enough lift to keep you in the air. In order to get enough thrust, though, you need to have some sort of thrust to weight ratio. I don't necessarily want to fly straight up, but I do want to fly pretty quick, and so I want to have a relatively high thrust to weight ratio. If your thrust to weight ratio is one, it means that you can fly straight up because you have enough thrust to counteract weight if you're flying straight up. If you have 80%, it means that you can't necessarily fly straight up, but you're going to be able to crank it if you want, you know, and then just hand launch it. If you have an aircraft that's like taxiing on a runway and needs to take off, you can get away with like 70 or 60%. It'll just take you a long time to cruise down the runway. Um, so I picked a thrust to weight ratio of 80%, which means for a 43 ounce aircraft, I need about 33 ounces of thrust. 
I went online and I found a Emacs 2216-810 kV motor with a 10 by 4.5 prop. So that's a really big prop, it's about 10 inches. And I'm getting 33 ounces of thrust with my four cell battery and I was able to find the weight of those two components. So you kind of need to choose the components that you think you're going to need and make sure you have enough thrust and then compute the weight. And then if you don't have enough thrust, pick a different motor and iterate. And you kind of have to go back and forth between motor selection and weight estimate. The fuselage is probably the hardest component to estimate. And so what I did is I said, I want a big aircraft that, that is fast. So I want a four foot wingspan aircraft. And I kind of said 48 inches. And my capstone advisor uh, used to tell me if it looks good, it flies good. So I said 48 inches, 60 inches, that looks good. It'll probably fly good. And I just said, give me like an inch and then use the density of balsa. And I got around 16 ounces. Now 16 ounces is pretty high for a, a fuselage and an inch thick, an inch thick is a lot, but keep in mind, like I'm gonna make a wing box and a fuselage and a tail boom. And I'm also going to maybe put landing gear on this thing. And so I wanted to make, I wanted to overestimate it. If you overestimate the weight, so I estimated the weight about 40, I got 43, but I like a nice round number. So I picked 40 ounces. If you, if you overestimate the weight, you will overestimate the wing. If you have bigger wings, you'll have more lift. You'll, you'll decrease your wing loading, right? If you increase the area of the wing, your wing loading will go down, which means you'll just be that much more maneuverable. Now, at the same time, the lift is not free. If you have bigger wings, you're gonna have more weight, you're gonna have more lift, but you're also gonna have more drag, which means you need more thrust. Everything is all connected. And again, you just kind of need a design point to go. If I build this and it doesn't work and it doesn't do how I want, I can turn the crank on this and iterate a little bit more. A lot of people, when they build aircraft, they kind of just, you know, go online, see what other people have done, or they go to Hobby Town and say like, hey, you know, what kind of aircraft can I build? And, you know, if you look at the guys on Flight Test, the Flight Test YouTube channel, I mean, they have years of experience where they kind of just know, like, that'll fly, that won't fly, they know what power pack to use, and you don't see all the behind the scenes, but they're testing and testing and testing their aircraft. And I don't know if they're doing this math behind the scenes, but they're at least throwing it in the air and testing it and seeing if it works, which is a completely other way to do uh, aircraft design. But I teach engineering, and so I want them to do the math first before they throw it in the air. Um, so anyway, so I chose my weight, I estimated my weight at 40 ounces. I have my thrust at 33 ounces, my thrust to weight ratio 80%. I can now invert this equation and solve for area. So I need a 2.7 square foot wing. and I'm going to just go with a traditional rectangular wing, so I'm going to have a wingspan here and a cord length, but now I need to determine how long the wing is going to be versus the cord length. So there's this parameter called aspect ratio, where aspect ratio tells you how long your wing is versus the cord length. So if you're a glider, if you've seen gliders, or even the U2 bomber, you've seen those are huge wingspans, very, very big aspect ratios. And the reason why is because when you're flying an airplane, you're going to have high pressure underneath the wing and you're going to have low pressure on top. And that high pressure is going to bring your aircraft up. Now the problem is, is that as you go out, you have an area of high pressure here and low pressure. And high pressure likes to go to low pressure. So what's going to happen is, is that the high pressure is going to kind of swing around. And it's going to make what's called wingtip vortices. And what happens is, is that because of that wingtip vortex, it pushes down on this and you actually get zero lift at the end. So if you look at the lift distribution of a wing, you're gonna have most of your lift, minus the fuselage, most of your lift in the center, and it's gonna slowly ramp down to zero. So your wing tips really don't create any lift, but you have to end the wing somewhere. So the point is, is that the longer you make your wing, the more you delay that wing tip vortex, which mean, and, and winglets are put on aircraft as well to sort of stop that and impede the, the, the high to low pressure um, to increase lift there, but they add weight, and they might, you might have to kind of, you know, structurally put them on there and things like that. So you have to kind of play a game on how big of an aspect ratio do you want. The bigger the aspect ratio, the more weight you're going to have and the more flexible that you're, that you're going to have to worry about. So um, I, I picked some random numbers here based on some balsa wood that I had lying around. So I had... I had some balsa that was about, you know, nine, nine inches. So I picked, I know I just said I like nice round numbers and I realized these kind of came out of nowhere, but I ended up getting an aspect ratio of about four and a half. 
And so if you look at the, the there's, a, there's an efficiency curve that shows efficiency as a function of aspect ratio, and it's, uh, it's quadratic. So as you increase aspect ratio, if you go from like four to eight, that's a lot different from going from one to four. You're still increasing by a fact four to eight. It's a lot different from going to two to four. So if you go two times two is four, four times two is eight, the, the, the efficiency increase from two to four is a lot bigger than four to eight. So I just put it at four and a half. I think most aircraft, I think uh, RC aircraft are like six. I think that's a, a good number. But if you're anywhere between four and six, I think you're, you're pretty good. And so basically aspect ratio is the wingspan squared divided by the area. And the area is just the wingspan times the chord. And so you have two unknowns and two equations and you can solve for um, you can solve for the wingspan and the chord length. So again, I had to kind of, I had to go in and say, I'm just going to pick an aspect ratio of four and a half. You can pick whatever you want. I figured four and a half was good. Um, so that gives me a nine inch chord length and a 41 inch uh, wingspan. Now, if you notice that does 41 inches does completely change my fuselage estimate. But again, if I over engineer the aircraft, it's probably fine. Once you get past this point, it's time for you to kind of go on the computer and do some math and make some charts and graphs and, and, and look at the performance of your aircraft. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to pick an airfoil and then use uh, X-Foil or X-Flyer 5 and get the aerodynamic coefficients of your airfoil. I'm going to pick the exact same airfoil as this, which is a flat bottom and a curved upper surface. It's very, very easy to build and cut out and balsa even by hand. And I need to double check, but I'm pretty sure this is the Clark y, y airfoil. So I'm going to post another video after this where I'm just in front of the computer and I'm going to put the, this airfoil, <clears throat> excuse me, this airfoil into X foil and I'm going to get the lift and drag co uh, characteristics. Once you get the lift and drag co characteristics of your airfoil, you need to convert the airfoil to a three dimensional wing. So as I said before, with these wingtip vortices, you need to take into account the effect that those wingtip vortices have on your wing. And if you assume an elliptic lift distribution, which is typically okay, you can use this equation here that says if you take your sectional lift coefficient and divide it by one plus sectional lift over pi times your aspect ratio, you will get your three dimensional lift. And you can see here that if your aspect ratio is zero, this whole thing blows up and your lift coefficient is, is Yeah, this, this goes to, if this goes to zero, this goes to infinite, and, you're, and your lift coefficient goes to zero, sorry, it, it doesn't blow up. Um, this becomes infinity, and something anything divided by infinity is zero. So if your aspect ratio is zero, you just have an airfoil, your three-dimensional lift is zero, because you basically have wingtip vortices that turn into a circle and you get no lift. Now, if you make your aspect ratio go out to infinity, what happens is, is that this whole term goes to zero, and you get your 2D lift, your sectional lift, is the same as your three-dimensional lift. And so if you have an infinite wing, you can approximate the three-dimensional lift as 2D lift. And so that's why you want your aspect ratio to be as big as possible. Um, the pi in there it comes from the uh, elliptic lift distribution integral. There's an integral that you have to use uh, complex variables to do, like some residue theorems, and you get that pi in there. Uh, but that's, that's for another video that I probably won't do. Anyway. Uh, on the computer, I'm going to use XFOIL to get my aerodynamic coefficients, compute to three-dimensional wing, um, three-dimensional wing uh, coefficients, and then I need to figure out how fast do I want this aircraft to fly. Now, I said I want it to fly fast, um, and I kind of just ballparked this. I want my cruise speed to be 25 miles an hour. That's not my max speed; it's my cruise speed. And so I'm going to design my cruise speed to be 25 miles an hour, and then I'll show you on the computer that once you have that cruise speed. I can determine, based on flight speed, density, and area, which I already have the area, I can figure out how much lift I need. Based on my aerodynamic coefficients, I can determine the angle of attack, and the angle of attack is the angle with respect to the free stream air. So this is an angle of attack of zero, and this is positive angle of attack. If I'm flying like this, I'm going to get more lift. At angle of attack of zero, because I have a cambered airfoil, I'm still going to get lift, but the more angle of attack I do, the more lift I'm going to generate. The thing is, the reason why I want to compute this is because as I increase angle of attack, I'm also going to increase drag. And I want to do these equations because I want to make sure A, I have enough lift, and B, I have enough thrust. And that's what I'm going to do with these equations here. And so at this point, my aircraft is pretty much designed. 
I don't even really need to do these these uh, these calculations here. They're just kind of nice to have if you want to optimize your you know your your airfoil and things like that and have some nice lift to drag properties. And I have my students do this just to kind of do like a full endurance calculation on it. And so if you have your aircraft designed all the way to number four and five, you could just build it. But once you build it, you need to weigh it and make sure that your weight is around what you thought it was. And you probably want to do a thrust test and make sure that your thrust is around what you thought it was. Otherwise, the aircraft definitely won't fly. At that point, if you have all your control surfaces in the right spot and you're balanced, right, you have your center of mass and right around the quarter cord of the wing, your aircraft uh, will probably fly no problem. Um, this is a really, really quick um, video on sort of the first part, the one through five on the wing cube loading, the weight estimate, the area, the shape of the wing, and then picking an airfoil. And I'll do a follow-up video where I discuss all of these equations in more detail and make some plots and things like that. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you later.